Most welcome to this ISTP forum. For those who don't know, ISTP is an independent uh, think tank here in Stockholm with a uh, slight uh, focus on, on Asia, Central Asia and East Asia. But today we're, we will talk about the United States and the effects of the uh, election, the US election. With me I have, or well, we have, uh, five distinguished panelists, and let me uh, introduce them in alphabetical order, just to make sure that we don't get upset. Uh, we have Ambassador Orjan Werner, that's a former ambassador to India, Poland, Russia, Germany, and France. We also have Ulrike Kronenberg Mosberg, former senior advisor on development policy in Africa and former ambassador of Sweden to Lithuania and Macedonia. We also have uh, Karin Enström, presently Deputy Chair of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, but also the former minister, Swedish Minister for Defence. We have Ken Forslund, Ken G. Forslund, Member of the Swedish Parliament and Chair of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. And Karin Enström represents the Moderate Party, and Kenneth Forslund represents the Social Democratic Party. We also have Sven Hirman, former State Secretary in the Swedish Ministry of Defense and also former Ambassador to Israel and Russia. I would like to start by asking or posing one question each, each to, to the panelists and they will have roughly five minutes each to, uh, to answer and uh, come with a statement and then uh, the debate will uh, take off and they can um, Pose questions to each other and, and comment each other, and then also, of course, we would open up for for uh, questions from the audience. But let me start <coughs> then by uh, asking uh, the man in the middle, uh, Mr. Kenneth Fosh Foshlog. <coughs> Do you think that with the Trump presidency, that Sweden's foreign policy has to change? Do you foresee that you will take decisions or, or try to take decisions in the Committee on Foreign Affairs that will influence the Swedish foreign policy? And are you worried that this will mean something uh, of a major uh, shift in, in our Swedish foreign, foreign policy? Well, thank you very much for arranging this and inviting us. Um, I think Swedish foreign policy is based upon values. Those values don't change uh, depending on who's running America or other countries. We are firm on those, and I would say that the fundamental values of it, we're firm on with a very broad political support in the Swedish parliament. So actually, I think that if you look at different governments in Sweden, you could see that there is a lot of the foreign policy that we actually agree on uh, broadly. Then there are some issues we don't agree on and mainly perhaps on, on security policy. Um, we are now in a state where we don't know what really will happen. We have seen so far uh, for the past uh, few weeks a uh, number of U-turns in the message from uh, uh, the president-elect Donald Trump so we really don't know what to expect. Uh, and what we realize, and realized, I would say, even before the election, uh, thinking of the possibilities of having uh, Donald Trump elected as the, the next president, we could foresee an uncertainty of what would the American foreign policy be, uh, how would their attitude in the world be, and how will they conduct or behave. Um, I would say very little is known. It very, it's very dependent on which people he chooses to surround himself with um, and um, probably also how he reacts to different occasions, different um, uh, both threats and, and incidents around the world. Uh, when it comes to, to Swedish, Swedish foreign policy, I think, as I said, it's based upon values. 
but values also transfer into action. And there are some areas where we have been able to, for uh, these past eight years at least, been having a very close cooperation with America. Uh, and uh, some of those corporations, we could uh, start imagining that that won't be as easy to cooperate with this administration. Uh, for example, already when the, the uh, Swedish government was based upon a center-right coalition, we established a close cooperation between Sweden and the United States when it comes to the development aid. And, um, we found very good ways to do that. And some of the projects and some of the uh, things we are doing there, I think that perhaps with a Republican, rather conservative administration, we won't agree upon doing those uh, projects together any longer. That comes, for instance, when it comes to uh, issues of sexual reproductive health and, and rights, uh, when it comes, when in that area than abortion rights and things like that, uh, which we have been having some cooperation among, between our countries. Then. So I think that there are a lot of things to be seen. Uh, the big problem at the moment is what we don't know, the fact that so much is unknown and unpredictable at the moment. Uh, America has elected a president with actually no political record. So we don't really know what to expect. We find some articles, 20 years old, where he opposes the, the thoughts of free trade, which we find that, all right, those positions he seems to have still. But in a lot of areas, most areas, he's pretty much a blank sheet, and uh, we don't know where we will end and where the conflicts, because there is always in conflicts in politics and, and between interests, but where will the conflicts be? Uh, that is still to be seen. And I think that this is a problem to the uh, peace and security in the world, because these, this also opens possibilities and, and uh, areas for other parts in the world, other countries, other leaders, uh, who definitely don't share the same values as we do in Sweden. Thank you very much. Let me um, turn to uh, <coughs> Karin Enström and um, talk about NATO and Sweden and, and European uh, foreign security and, 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 and foreign and security policy. President-elect uh, Trump has said some um, worrying things about NATO and uh, also with con consequences for, for Sweden and for Europe. Do you think that he will go ahead with what he has said, or do you think that there will be a major change when it comes to NATO's participation and uh, the future of NATO? NATO? And also um, with the European Defense Union, perhaps taking on a, a larger role, do you think that there will be great changes uh, in the near future, perhaps in the, in the well. Well, thank you, and thank you, thank you also for inviting me to this seminar. Uh, first of all, I would like to to underline, uh, and also, well, I, I I agree a lot with uh, with uh, Kenneth regarding how unpredictable this president-elect uh, is. But to start with, to state the obvious, uh, for Sweden as a small very export-oriented country, it's always important who is the President of the United States. And uh, it's also important that we, there is a President in the US who can show leadership, uh, not at least on issues as security policy and trade. And now we have a lot of unknown unknowns, even, and that's even more dangerous because uh, the president-elect uh, has been inconsistent on several issues. He has, as uh, Mr. Forslund said, uh, made already some U-turns. And just that fact that we don't know, that is dangerous as such, because this opens up. It may tempt other leaders to just test this guy 
maybe already before he's, uh, he is um, uh, inaugurated. Regarding NATO is of course worrying. Uh, what does he think about Europe? Uh, is he ready to, in a way, cut or weaken the transatlantic link? That is of course of high importance uh, for us. Um, on the other hand, um, he will be surrounded by quite a, a solid Republican majority in both houses. Uh, so, uh, my, well, my hopes, my belief is regarding security policy that the Republican majority in Washington will continue or, well, if not force, at least help him uh, to, to continue a traditional U.S.-NATO policy. Uh, but at the same time, we must be very aware of and listen to the signals regarding, uh, well, if not new demands, really, this is something that has been uh, put through uh, from, from other American administrations as well. Europe has to take its own responsibility for its security. You must pay more. You cannot be free riders. And to be fair, that's quite reasonable that we should take, take our own security seriously uh, uh, regarding if you want the guarantee or, or some kind of hopes that you will receive some help. So I think this will, of course, put more pressure to, to NATO's members regarding defense spending. And for Sweden, uh, this is, um, uh, can fold out in, in unfold in, in several scenarios. Um, we have, during the last years, uh, I would say increased our dependency on, on US. We have a very uh, intense and deep uh, relation, um, especially on the security and defense policy area. And what will this precedent mean to this? What we can do now is, I would say, try to influence uh, the president-elect and his his incoming administration, to be very clear what the Swedish interest would be. But for me uh, and, and my party, I would say it would feel less, I would feel less vulnerable if we were part of NATO, not just dependent on one bilateral, even if it's with, a, uh, with the world's largest um, of military nation, uh, to have a more, how can I say, diversified uh, dependency than, than just with the US. Um, many European leaders uh, at this moment are, of course, worried, and we can see now a lot of proposals coming from, especially France, but also Italy and Germany. Now is the time to create a European army or EU army. Um, I think that we will see many of these proposals, well, well, they will go away, but there is, of course, a core of, of, uh, of something uh, both important and interesting. Uh, and I think for, for Sweden, uh, a Euro European defense cooperation is extremely important. There are a lot of things that we should and can do together, but without creating a common army. But we have to work together regarding uh, shortfalls uh, when it comes to capabilities. Uh, it's, it's smart to cooperate when it comes to research and development and to procurement issues. And it's also smart to, to look into uh, planning, uh, well, planning resources when it comes especially to crisis management. So, so looking into that, if we can have a, uh, how can I say, more light on, on these kinds of cooperation, I think it's, it's something good that we need to do uh, regardless what uh, the US president will do. Um, I, will, I will also, I, I believe that um, we have to be very vigilant. We have to try to be very clear, both in, in EU, uh, what our interests are, and EU must be very clear towards US, how important the transatlantic link is, uh, both when it comes to security, but also uh, trade and economy. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the United States is not only a large military uh, force in the nation, it's also the world's largest donor when it comes to foreign aid. And 
Mr. Trump has stated that the, U the United States should, quote, stop sending foreign aid to countries that hate us, unquote. Uh, and let me turn to Ulrich uh, Ekman and Moskva and ask you, do you think that this will result in a major change? And if so, do you think that countries like Sweden have to take a larger role when it comes to foreign aid, or do you see foresee major changes in that field? Well, what has been said by other speakers before me is that we don't know. And I think in the, in the, in the area of, of, of foreign aid, uh, Trump has not said very much at all, with the exception of, as, as you already said, that we shouldn't give aid to, people that hate, uh, to countries that hate us. He has also very clearly said that America comes first. So he would rather build roads and schools in, in America than build them elsewhere. He has also stated that he will renegotiate all trade deals and other alliances or other deals that, um, in order to make them more favorable to the United States. And the ones that he has been thinking about, of course, are the NAFTA, North, Africa, uh, North, North American Trade uh, Association Agreement, uh, the, the Transatlantic Agreement with Europe, and the Trans-Pacific Agreement with, with, with Asian countries. They're all part of, could be all part of this. Uh, another another uh, agreement is the AGOA, you've probably never heard of it, is the African Growth and, and Opportunity Act, which is extremely important for Africa. Um, that is what he has said. He has also said that he will give priority to anything that has to do with perceived threats to the United States. And that would be Islamic extremism, terrorism, migration, and disease. And as you all know, he has said that uh, global warming is a Chinese invention. He has backtracked on that, but I will come back to that later. And he has voiced great skepticism towards multilateral organizations. I think the only one he's really mentioned is, is, is United Nations. Uh, but we, we know that he has a great skepticism for that. What could we, I mean, if this is all carried out, well, it looks rather gloomy for the future and for development cooperation in the world. What Sweden can do, well, we will do the same as we did last time there was a change of government and when areas where we were very prominent and where we worked closely together with the United States, for example, as you mentioned, sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, we will have to foot the bill. I mean, if the United States decides to withdraw funding for certain areas uh, within the United Nations, or well, other countries will have to, to foot the bill. And we are already ready to, to do that. We have had a very good and close relationship with the, with the present administration, uh, not least in the area, not, not least in Africa, but also with, with the uh, refugees. As you maybe remember there was a big conference, two big conferences in, in New York in September on refugees, one new one and one by President Obama, and, and Sweden played a role in that. Um, but having, having said that, uh, and your last question was, will this change um, very much, uh, uh, will he learn, will, 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 will Mr. Trump change his mind? As I said, he already changed, has, has made some openings on climate change. But I'm a bit wary there, because climate change has so many dimensions. He might wanted to change his mind with the agreement with China. He might not want to, to uh, leave, leave uh, the climate convention, but we don't, he hasn't said anything about funding. And of course, funding would be crucial, not only to the United Nations Fund on, on Environment, but also on, on, the, on the Green Fund. Uh, but uh, it, he's not, it's not only him. I mean, he has the Congress. Um, and on many areas in Congress, uh, there is bipartisan, there is a joint uh, unity on certain areas. For example, the American uh, uh, budget for foreign aid for, uh, has, uh, has unanim unanimity. And, and my people, the, bo both uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, are united on, on the amount. Then, of course, with a new administration, we don't know exactly if the money will go to the same areas. Uh, but I think, there, as, as far as we know, there are also uh, joint, I mean, both Republicans and, and um, uh, Democrats are 
united in that they want to continue supporting health, health issues in developing countries, HIV AIDS, a strong support, increased food security in the world, uh, of Mr. Obama's, uh, President Obama's um, Feed the Future, for example, uh, and also the cooperation with the private sector, which is very important. So I think that uh, he, what Obama has said that he will work with, he will uh, have trade, aid, and security that gives the United States the best deal. But there are many American companies uh, and, of course, organizations that are already working in different areas uh, with Belt and Cooperation, and they work very well together with the rest of us, and, and I think they will continue, continue working. There's also a support in Congress by Muslim by Republicans on not maybe nation building, Trump is not very keen on nation building, but on creating governance, good governance, rule of law, and uh, in order to and, and fight corruption, in order to make it easier to do business. And of course, this is a very wide, wide spectrum of things that we can do, and Americans can do in that space. So I think that will continue. But where, where, what will be the road kills that we fear? Uh, that will uh, less to the United Nations, and especially less to, to, uh, to for example, as we, as we said before, sexual reproductive health and rights, the UNFPA. Uh, there will be less, uh, probably, hope not, as I said, UN Climate Convention and the Green Fund. There might be less for women and girls, less for gender. There might be less for, for, uh, for gays' rights. Uh, and there might be less for human rights in, in general. We, but we don't really know. He hasn't said anything on migration with the exception of, of, of throwing out all the, the Mexicans, but ref refugees and, migra and, and not accepting Syrian refugees, but except for that, he hasn't said anything more about that. And uh, we do not know if anything about bilateral, American bilateral aid. We haven't heard anything about how, about how that will continue. So we are very much uh, insecure, us in the blue, but as I said before, with the bipartisan support uh, for very fundamental things in Congress, uh, I, I hope that things will not change that much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, it seems that we, uh, we're all landing at the uh, phrase, we don't know. Uh, but, uh, of course, this is also true perhaps uh, in relations between the United States and, and, and Russia. Um, and. Um, President-elect Trump has said that um, he will reset the, the relations with Russia. The same thing, in, in fact, uh, President uh, Obama said. And Ambassador Hilman, do you think that, that this will actually happen? Uh, or do you think that something will come in between? Or, or, or don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the short, very short answer to your question is that I think there will be a reset. I think that will be good. But let me elaborate uh, uh, a bit. Uh, first, a couple of caveats. First, on the, uh, the first one on the election campaign. The election campaign was an election campaign where Trump played a role. I compared him to Zhirinovsky in Russia. Uh, he played a role in order to capture uh, the uh, electorate that he, you know, he saw could be, become a majority. And his aim was to win. He's a winner. In a sense, I think it was more important for him to win the presidency than to be president. We will see. And I'm not sure he will be such an active president. I mean, he, he has achieved his goal as a, as a winner, first point. Second point, and that's the, the, the uncertainty, of course, that's his uh, personality. Uh, and while there are countervailing institutions in, in um, the U.S., the Congress, the court, and all this and that, personality matters. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back on Bush uh, Jr., a nice guy, came, became president in the beginning of 2001. Everyone liked him. He looked into the eyes of Putin and looked very fine all through summer 2001. And then came 9-11, and with his then advisors, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Wolfowitz, and so on, he became, I would say, one of the worst war presidents uh, in the United States. So personality matters. Now, uh, then the timing. In a sense, I, I believe this seminar is a bit too early, comes too early. Uh, we don't uh, yet know who will become the Secretary of State, the Foreign Minister, and neither the, the uh, Defense Minister. These are important 
appointments. We don't know yet. Uh, Trump has said that he, and that's a, more of a constant, that he wants to put America's interests first. Uh, that's nothing new. Every American president has done, done, done this, including President Obama. President Obama visited Sweden in September 2013, uh, just during uh, the, the, the chemical crisis uh, over Syria. And he said, well, we, do what, we will do what we think is right. You know, whatever the UN inspectors say doesn't concern us. We, America's interests come first. So this is a line that many American presidents have, have, have taken. Uh, now, there are other constants, and that is, uh, I think uh, Trump reflects American public opinion in the sense that they, many believe that America is in a situation of imperial overstretch. Some of you may remember Paul Kennedy's uh, book from the early 90s, The Rise and Fall of Nations. And it seems to me that after all these wars that America has been engaged in, there is now a mood, you know, we don't want any uh, more wars like this. We should concentrate on our own national material interest. And I think uh, Trump represents this. So I think it's rather likely uh, that we will see uh, a Trump presidency that tries to disengage from foreign uh, conflict, for instance, in Syria. Uh, and also, probably likely that he'll be a uh, protectionist in, 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 in uh, trade policies. I mean, he has said that. Now on Russia, to come to the, the, uh, this question. I think it's been constant in the election campaign, what he said after this, as late as yesterday, in an interview with Tom Friedman in Financial Times, yes, he wants an agreement with Russia. I think he, see, uh, he wants this as part, again, of this withdrawal from unnecessary conflict. Now, what would such an agreement look like? Gideon uh, Rachman, who is the senior foreign policy editor uh, in the Financial Times, tried to you know, discuss it, spit it out last week in an article, and he made this point, that uh, Trump probably would put uh, Crimea on the back burner. Uh, he will probably be in favor of lifting economic sanctions on, on, on Russia. He will stop insisting that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of uh, NATO. And in exchange for that, uh, Putin uh, would stop his aggression in eastern Ukraine. He would stop making all this uh, propaganda and pressure on the Baltic countries. There will be less military bilateral tensions between uh, Russia and the United States, for instance, here in the Baltic Sea area. And the two countries will try to concentrate to do something constructively in the Middle East, particularly on Syria. Uh, I think they probably will try to do this. I think this will be positive, and positive for Sweden too. Now, if you look at the Russian uh, reactions to Trump, all along during the election campaign, uh, Russian public opinion, politicians, they favored and given more attention to Trump than to Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was, is perceived in Moscow as being a cold warrior. Uh, Trump as a businessman, a man with whom you can do business, and it's also a fact, if you look over a longer period of time, that most uh, uh, disarmament and other sort of important uh, bilateral agreements between the Russians and the Soviets uh, and the Americans have been done during a, a Republican presidency. They have easier to sort of understand each other. Uh, now, in case of, so, so, I mean, uh, Putin has said some welcoming words uh, about uh, Trump, but not really doing it. I think he's, he's a cautious man. And you know that could be, you know, uh, there could be problems, <laughs> not least because of, of, of um, uh, Trump's, Trump's uh, personality. And the Russians are very aware of the very strong anti-Russian feelings in the U.S. Congress. For instance, <coughs> I mean, one thing is what uh, Trump says; the other are all his advisers, the Congress, public opinion. Uh, but again, I, I think that we should welcome, if there is an agreement uh, between the Americans and the Russians, to lower tension between themselves and try to do something constructively <coughs> on Syria that's good for Sweden. So I don't share, I don't believe in, in the sort of the, the uh, scaremongering uh, that we hear from some of the East European countries. This is bad, this is dangerous. No, I think it's good. The less military tension between the great powers, the better, the better for Sweden too. Final point possibly, and that's on, on sanctions. Uh, there is another player coming into, uh, on, 
uh, up on the scene, and that is the, the former French um, uh, Prime Minister, Monsieur Fillon. I don't know whether you heard his uh, speech in Lyon yesterday, but he said very clearly, and he's likely to win the, the Republican nomination, he's rather likely to become the next uh, French president uh, in six months' time, that he wants a settlement with Russia, he will go for the lifting of sanctions. So you will have pressure from Trump, you will have pressure from Fillon, and that will change uh, la donne, uh, as the French say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me then turn to uh, Ambassador Werner. With your vast experience as diplomat in uh, Germany and France and, and also Russia, if uh, the United States would uh, be less engaged in the security uh, of uh, Europe, how do you think Russia will act and how do you think France and Germany will, will react uh, to, to those actions that might come? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, well, I'll cover to some extent the same territory that uh, Sven did. Uh, uh, I land some in somewhat different uh, conclusions, I believe. Uh, uh, but uh, the first point uh, in, let's say, four different points would be to say that uh, uh, foreign policy, I reacted a little bit to the idea that foreign policy is dictated by values. I think that foreign policy is principally dictated by interests. And obviously values make a part of these interests. But if you look at particularly the great powers, actions and policies, let's say the United States in regard to a regime like Saudi Arabia, uh, you find that uh, probably values were not prevalent in the very close relationship. Uh, that is the first point, and, and that is also true for Trump. I mean, American interest, widely defined, is likely to dictate uh, his policies, which of course are a combination of uh, congressional pressure, other pressures, the kind of people he appoints, etc., uh, etc. Et so that, uh, given the fact that he is a fairly uh, he's a novice in the foreign policy, he probably be influenced quite substantially by people he appoints, particularly in the foreign ministry and defense ministry uh, positions. Um, well, and then the second point, uh, well, everyone agrees that he is unpredictable. Now, he, is have, is, he has himself said he is unpredictable, and he has also claimed that the unpredictability is an asset. And to some extent, I agree. I mean, in some respects, obviously, it's not an asset in regard to the NATO uh, sort of uh, obligations, uh, particularly of interest, of course, to the Baltic countries, unpredictably is, is very bad. In other respects, where you do not have uh, obligations, let's say Ukraine, <coughs> unpredictability could be an asset, uh, not necessarily, but could be. Obama said, Ukraine is not a core national security interest for the United States. I would regard that as a very bad uh, public statement. I mean, it might be said internally, but publicly, of course, it's not very good. That has a ring of uh, predictability, which was, in this case, not very good. Now, the third point, uh, uh, referring specifically to the question here, uh, the European security. Of course, we, uh, in our case, uh, we think about the Balts and about Ukraine. Uh, obviously, there are security interests relating to Turkey, for example, where, after all, there was a very tense Russian-Turkish situation. There are obviously uh, <laughs> sort of interesting aspects about the evolution in Moldova and such places. Uh, uh, but for us, of course, the Baltic situation is particularly important. Now, I would say that the U.S. support and uh, the U.S. position is absolutely essential. I don't really believe, having spent uh, considerable time, for example, in France, that you could count upon uh, the French if there is a conflict regarding the Baltic countries, irrespective of the NATO obligations. 
And you also have to, uh, of course, be aware of the fact that the NATO obligations are by no means very clear. Uh, you are not supposed necessarily to intervene militarily. You decide yourself what response you give to a military attack on one of the members of the alliance. So uh, there are all sorts of things from nuclear war to diplomatic protests uh, can be used uh, and to f fulfill the obligations. Now, uh, the US, of course, has a history of support to the Baltic nations all through the Cold War, the Soviet Union, uh, sort of West Cold War. Uh, and, and uh, of course, uh, I was in Moscow at the time, and, and I, I, I saw that one of the reasons why the Soviet leadership did not sort of quash or suppress the Baltic independence movement was precisely the pressure from the United States, in this case, the possibility to halt all sorts of deliveries of foodstuffs to the then very needy Soviet Union. So the, Soviet, the, the US has all along been uh, very involved in the Baltic countries. I don't think you could say that for the other, for the Europeans. So US is absolutely essential. Uh, uh, now, what would they do? in various scenarios. Once again, I believe that the US is essential because when you look at the security situation of the Baltic countries, it's highly unlikely, I would say, that the Russians and some people like the RAND uh, uh, organization uh, had a scenario about an all-out attack on the Baltic countries. Seems extremely unlikely, but you could see all sorts of other scenarios where conflicts escalate and Russian intervention becomes possible. Now there, of course, the US has all the a panoply of different measures to be taken. Uh, there was an interesting TV series the other day, or TV program the other day, about Stuxnet. Stuxnet was, of course, the, the technique used to, in, to impact on Iranian nuclear reactors with disastrous effects. Uh, an American-Israeli combination, uh, combined attack. Now the U.S. has that capacity. I don't think the Europeans has neither the capacity nor the will to sort of um, uh, use uh, such capacities. And therefore, once again, the uh, um, uh, U.S. is absolutely essential. The Trump uh, statements, uh, of course reflect, as was mentioned, uh, the U.S. interest many times repeated that Europeans should be, should be doing more for their own defense. Uh, the Balts are a mixed crowd. I mean, the, the Estonians make, uh, have about 2%, the Lithuanians and the Latvians have about 1%, like Swedes. Uh, uh, and of course, Obviously, it would be a good thing if they increase, as they have decided to do, and, and they are supposed to reach 2% in a couple of years. Uh, so they are sort of doing that, and I think that's absolutely essential, uh, because uh, the Americans, as we know from the Finnish experience, are very much sort of aware of what, uh, what countries do to sort of protect themselves, to do something for their own defense. Ukraine, coming to that as a fourth point, uh, is of course a totally different matter. And uh, Sven mentioned the possibility of uh, a deal, the big deal, combining uh, Ukraine and Syria. Uh, I was in Moscow a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> uh, we have both spent uh, many years in Moscow. Uh, I must say I was struck by the uh, tremendous importance of the Western pressure to uh, fortify the position of the Kremlin, of Putin. Uh, all over the place there was a big exhibition, uh, Russia, My History, was the title. Uh, uh, the idea was that Russia has been subject to Western pressure, to efforts to occupy or to destroy or to suppress Russia as a great power. <coughs> Uh, and the very idea is that the West is constantly doing this. Sanctions is an excellent example in the Russian optics, not 
posing from our perspective. Uh, but that, the, the very idea of Western pressure uh, is used to fortify the position of the, of the regime. Now, if that is so, uh, the interest to conclude any big deal uh, really must ba be based on a uh, sense of victory. And the sense of victory uh, for Russia, of course, is extremely difficult to achieve given that the margins of any administration in the US is on this subject reasonably narrow. And also given the fact that the Europeans, the Germans particularly, because, uh, well, the, the, Sven is right, Fillon is a very uh, pro-Kremlin uh, uh, politician, and he will win, no doubt. Uh, uh, still, the Germans with Mrs. Merkel are likely to protest if there is any kind of major concession being made about uh, Ukrainian issues. So I think uh, the prospects for big deals, uh, they might be tried, but they are probably fairly slim. Thank you so much. I think now, we, before we open up uh, to questions, uh, you have an opportunity to uh, comment on each other's uh, comments. So I, I think that uh, Sven, you might say that you again, going after that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, if I can make a few quick comments. The first one is to emphasize what uh, Orian Berne said, that Sweden's foreign policy interests are basically based on ge our geopolitical interests. Yes, values are important. They're sort of the, the cream on the cake, if I put it simply. I spent the last couple of months studying our former foreign minister, Östen and Dien, to do it. He, he was foreign minister for 20 years. And it's a lot of realism that you go back on, you know, if you study Sweden's foreign policy for the last 200 years, the geopolitical interest, that, that's the decisive uh, uh, moving force. First point, on, on uh, defense matters, uh, I think and that's a guess that the, we've had a very sharp uh, debate on Sweden's security policy in the last two, three years about joining NATO or not. I think there will be a shift, a slight shift in this debate now, less concentration on joining NATO and more on strengthening Sweden's defense on forces. So we've already seen that. We've seen that from some of the political parties we see in the debate. I think this is good. It's a good shift. We have to put our own house in order. And I think the Trump uh, presidency, the, you know, the demands he makes on NATO countries and all that, that will reinforce it. So I think this is good. And I think also possibly that Sweden should, uh, um, I think we are over-relying on, on US support. And I think possibly that, that will uh, diminish. Final point on, on Russia, I do think that the Kremlin, the Putin regime, would like to de-escalate the tension they have uh, with the West, because they do need Western technology. They do need to get rid of the sanctions. They are European. So if there is such a move uh, from, from the American side, that will be welcome. And I think that would be good. And uh, that would, I, I believe, you know, it would lead to you know, a little less uh, military exercises and, and clamor here in the Baltic Sea area, and that will be good for the Balts too, if, if this uh, happens. And I think we should welcome this, and uh, we should encourage uh, encourage this. That's my point. Thank you. Corinne. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm going to shock you. On the first two points that uh, Mr. Hillman said, I, I, I agree. We're not always uh, <laughs> agreeing, but uh, uh, I think we also in Sweden will see some, some return of uh, Realpolitik. Yeah. Um, and I also believe that we, um, I think we will, will continue our debate on security policy, uh, but as you say, I think there will be um, a shift towards to get our own house in order and in a way to try to, to consolidate uh, what we have and those, those corporations that we, we have and bilateral relations. Um, but I, uh, I do not agree, and I, I, I am really worried about just the thought of deals between Mr. Putin and Mr. Trump. Uh, for me, it's, it's something really dangerous, uh, because for me, that's the start of having a bipolar world again, when it's not, uh, and we have seen this trend already, 
it's not a world order uh, based on, on rules in the international law, it's a world order based on, on power. And being, as I said, a small country, uh, it's not at all in our interest to have a deal between uh, the US and Russia uh, because you will get squeezed uh, in the middle somewhere, I think, with these deals. And I think the price, if the price is to pay uh, to say goodbye to Crimea and to half of Ukraine, I think that's really, really a bad deal for, for Europe uh, and for, for, for Ukraine too, but also for, for Europe, the rest of Europe and for Sweden. Um, and uh, I think that having, and this is not easy these days, but when you have a common stance from, from the EU, this, uh, and if this is in the line of what the US also thinks, then we can affect uh, Russia, call it pressure or call it something else. But I don't, I don't think you can use uh, soft talk, uh, soft words in this situation. Thank you. Uh, Ken? Well, I think definitely that uh, realism is uh, certainly a part of our foreign policies, but if we look at our values, why do we have those values? It's not only because of, of goodness, uh, there are also values that are important to us because we like them, we cherish them, but also because that if they are shared by more countries, more people, they also gives us a greater possibility to, to uh, uh, remain as a country and as a culture and to work in the favour of our interests. So sometimes perhaps it's hard to say what comes first, the hen or the egg. I think that of course, they interact, but I want to have foreign policies uh, based upon values, but we also need to know why do we have those values, and why do we want them to share them with more countries and people, because that would work in favor of our lifestyle and our situation and all our geographical position and things like that. Thank you very much. We have to talk about the the other side of the world, about China and Japan and, and East Asia. And, and President-elect Trump has already said that he will scrap the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement, which uh, others say is an extremely good deal for the uh, countries in, in East Asia. I don't know if anyone one of you would like to comment on that. Do well, you think that China and Japan now will take more room? Uh, or will there be opportunities for them to, um, to act differently? Uh, and is there a possibility for Sweden uh, to, uh, to have a better relationship with, for instance, Japan, who is now a, a member of the Security Council at the same time as we will become a security, member of the Security Council? Should we look for new partners that we haven't really, not new partners, but partners that we haven't really had such close cooperation with, uh, for instance, within the UN. Anyone? Would yes, sir. <laughs> I think the and it's interesting that the Chinese attitude to the election of Trump has been very cautious. I would say, sanguine. Uh, even though uh, Trump has been saying he, uh, he would introduce what is it, 45 percent uh, import uh, tariffs on uh, Chinese exports and so on. Uh, I think the Chinese are very well aware of their own strengths, their economic and commercial strengths. I think one good factor here in Trump's policy may be that he will probably not continue what Obama and Hillary Clinton launched this American pivot to Asia, which I think was a mistake, because the Chinese looked upon this as ganging up against China and, and sharpened tensions between them. I think Trump will probably drop this. He will, you know, he, he will fight for uh, American uh, trade advantages, but uh, the Chinese are rather pragmatic and Japanese too. Um, I'm sure they could, you know, something could be worked out there. I'm not that worried. And Sweden seeking an alliance with Japan. Everyone is seeking an alliance with uh, Japan, including Russia, for instance. You know, there's been an uh, upsurge here in, in, in the Russian-Japanese relations and so on. Uh, for Sweden, Japan is a bit too far away, I would say. I think we have to concentrate uh, our efforts here in, in, in Europe. Uh, for, uh, Ulrike, then, uh, oh yeah. uh, I'm on the same line. I have a feeling that when, when Mr. Trump uh, 
realizes the cost, uh, he will probably rethink the whole thing. I have no figures on, on, uh, on uh, TTP, but I have figures on NAFTA. And as we all know, I mean, NAFTA is, is the agreement where he really has been spoken out against from the very beginning because he said it was unfavorable for the United States. Um, and there has been an, uh, an um, independent uh, think tank has cal calculated that and uh, on three scenarios that if the NAFTA is scrapped, uh, I mean, scrapped uh, for, for a year, that would uh, make a loss of 1.3 million jobs in the United States. And then they realize that, that maybe they will come to the census if they don't. So they go all out and they scrap the whole agreement. That would, that would uh, amount to a loss of 4.8 million jobs in the United States. And I have a feeling that if you scrap the other, the, the, the Trans-Pacific Agreement, there will be similar uh, worries about, about the loss of jobs. When it comes to the Transatlantic Trade Agreement, I think the Europeans are very, very capable of ruining it themselves. So, so and we will lose out from it, but there we are. Thank you, and uh, again. <clears throat> well, first, uh, as you mentioned, the Security Council and, and what we could do there. I, I was head of our UN, UN uh, office here in the Stockholm during an earlier period when we were Security Council members. And I presume things have not changed dramatically since then. Uh, so when I read that we have an agenda for the Security Council, I uh, find that a bit absurd because we are not likely to be able to decide anything uh, on the agenda regarding the agenda of the Security Council. Uh, that is decided principally by world events uh, and then of course by the big uh, permanent members. Uh, and what our role will be, will be possibly, if we have a good UN ambassador as we have, uh, to, to be able to sort of uh, uh, work in the corridors about finding good uh, formula for, for uh, uh, trying to reach agreements, which is, of course, a very useful and, and important role. Um, now, as to the deal, uh, the big deal, which some prefer and some others, uh, uh, I, I only said, in fact, that I find the likelihood of a deal very slim. Uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, whether it is desirable or not depends on the content. Uh, because obviously, as Sven said, it is a good thing to decrease tension uh, with a country which has the biggest or the next biggest nuclear arsenal in the world. And, and uh, of, if you are in Moscow and you sort of find the atmosphere uh, there, uh, you really get a bit concerned uh, because it is uh, the mirror image of the sort of most clearly anti-Putin parts of the, of the Western European opinion. That is to say, they are <coughs> thinking that we are all out to suppress them, to sort of keep them down, etc. Now, obviously, that is a wrong attitude, uh, no doubt, but it is there. And therefore, if things get hotter, I think that is very bad. So in that sense, deals are good, but of course, as you presumably uh, wanted to, to well, <laughs> want to say that, what you wanted to say, but, but <laughs> anyway, presumably what you meant was that uh, deals uh, which have concessions, which are uh, running against our principles, are bad. That's, that's pretty clear. Now, then you come to Crimea, <coughs> because that's the issue. I think Eastern Ukraine, uh, as I believe Sven intimated, uh, you can always find some kind of, of a, a sort of solution for that. Crimea, uh, well, uh, presumably the Russians will never uh, even think about leaving it. Uh, now, then comes what you do about that. Now, you have uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia. Uh, you have the Baltic countries. Uh, we recognize them. Uh, we recognize the, uh, the uh, Soviet possession of the Baltic countries. The United States did not. It was sort of in a limbo. Presumably, what one could possibly imagine about Crimea is the same thing. I mean, 
keeping it in limbo. You don't recognize, of course, the fact that it is part of, the Ru of Russia, but you don't do very much about it. That's, that's a possibility. If that means you can solve other issues, like Syria, for example, which also means concessions on the Western part, presumably, uh, if you can then uh, organize some kind of solution of eastern Ukraine, well, it's a balance, I would say. And, and uh, it might be right to say no, it might be right to say yes, a little bit depending on the balance. Thank you. Colleen? Yes, I <coughs> wanted just to say uh, uh, a few words on, on Asia. And if you look, uh, isn't it quite clear that... Uh, when when TPP won't won't um, won't function, uh, then my feeling is that you in a way put all these countries you push them into the the arms of, of China in a way. And where will that lead? I don't know. Uh, put that and combine that with uncertainties regarding uh, the uh, well, U.S. Uh, alliance with uh, Japan and South Korea, if the interest and engagement will decrease, then we can see, uh, unfortunately, maybe really, really worsening situation. So that is two factors that really can, can affect uh, the development. Thank you. I think, thank you so much. Uh, did, did you have a comment? Yeah, make a short one. Um, looking at the Trump campaign and his uh, historic message on, on Free trade, of course, we could be worried. I mean, we're a small country, very dependent on, on free trade in the world. And uh, but I don't know what we should think of a man that has a campaign baseball style cap, the red one. You have seen it all. On the outside, it says "Make America Great Again," and on the inside, it says "Made in China." Uh, I don't know what to do to make out of that. Actually. Thank you so much. I think, yeah. did you want to say something else? Yes, yeah, very short point. It uh, doesn't concern Asia, but should have been mentioned before. I think Karin was on to this. Europe. I think, or I suspect, or I guess, that we will see a trend now uh, from the Euro group to strengthen cooperation. Uh, the Brits are out. Uh, United States is changing. Uh, and again, Fillon said that now in this situation we must have the Euro government, we must have the Euro defense. I think this will be a rather strong effort from some of the countries. Now it doesn't only depend on the French, we have the Germans, we have the Italians, we have the Italian referendum uh, next week and all this and that. But it's rather likely that we get a strong force, we get a strong Euro, not EU, group government defense uh, finance, what have you. And that will be a headache for Sweden. This will affect Sweden at least as much as the, the, the Trump presidency. Probably there is already some thinking about it, but I, I just want to mention this is a very important factor for Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have some time now for, for questions and, and very short comments. And uh, I open up the floor, but I would like to ask you to make the questions very precise, very short. And if you have any comments, make that, those comments also very precise and short, because we have a limited time. And if you like, you can also introduce yourself and, see what, and, and tell us who you are. If you don't like, well, <laughs> we'll see what we do. Uh, so the, the, uh, the floor is open. And if you would like uh, to direct the question to any one of the panelists, you can do so. If you just would like to pose a general question, you can do so. Yes, please, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm Bakr Ambassador of Iraq. Uh, as we know, this election in the United States was something like a uh, divisive election and created a problem for the United States. So, do you think that uh, there's a possibility because as president elect uh, always he talk about that how he would he want to go to tackle the problem of the division this have not affect has not affect over 
the foreign policy of the United States. And number two, as there, is, there was some, we hear some uh, statement uh, that uh, United States want to uh, U.S. exit from the NATO. Uh, I, I, I think that's not very possible, but if there is, it's possible. It's not accelerate to building the European army. And what's the, uh, your opinion, or your um, attitude of the of foreign, uh, Swedish foreign policy uh, 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 regarding the building of the European army? Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anyone you would like to comment on that? Or? Yes. Well, when it comes to building a European army, uh, I mean, the Social Democratic Party, they, we want to keep Sweden as a military non-allied country. So uh, a European army or European uh, defense corporation, that is not uh, an appetizing uh, uh, alternative to the NATO membership to us. And I think, but others have to answer to that, but I, I don't think that the ones who prefer a NATO membership would want to, to have this instead. What I have experienced for some time is talking to politicians and then parliamentarians mainly in Europe is uh, an increasing demand for having something instead of NATO because there is a growing uh, uh, feeling and thinking that they don't trust NATO and this was long before Trump seemed to be a, a, a possible uh, forthcoming president so so this this isn't really linked to, to the election of him or not even the campaign or so. There is something within NATO countries uh, that I can't really put the finger to where they have a distrust actually in NATO and uh, even I, who don't uh, want a Swedish membership in NATO, finds that uh, actually worrying and, and a possible threat actually to European security. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, um, um, first question, I, I, I don't know if I, I got that really, uh, how, how the polarization may be within the U.S. If, if this will affect the foreign policy. Um, well, there, there is a huge challenge, and challenge is a very small word, um, when you look uh, and see the, the really, really deep um, uh, division uh, between between different uh, groups in the society, and that is, of course, something that we see in other countries as well. And that has to be has to be tackled. Um, and the, the really difficult issue is how to do that. Is it to create a, a maybe a, a foreign, a common enemy uh, outside the U.S.? Uh, hopefully not. Um, to to now start to speculate about a U.S. exit from NATO, from it's it's. For me, it's quite far-fetched. Uh, and if you see the, well, I, I met um, a lot of uh, congressmen from, from the US the last weekend. And uh, for me, it's quite clear there is a strong support from, from both the Republican Party and the Democratic <coughs> Party that, there, that the NATO is one of the cornerstones. So uh, I, I think it's, it's much too early to speculate. But I think the message that we have to take care of our own uh, defense and security uh, more is quite a clear message. It's not a new message, and that would lead to well uh, increased uh, defense spending in Europe and also this discussion about the European Army or European defense. And I try to be clear in my uh, introduction that um, I can see a lot of advantages uh, in in some areas, absolutely, uh, but no dupli duplication not doubling uh, anything that NATO already does. Thank you. Orion? Uh, well, I, I, uh, in fact, I repeat a little bit what I said before about uh, the fact that it is obviously in our interests uh, to, uh, uh, even if we are not members of NATO, to see to it that NATO is a functioning organization because only through the U.S. can we be reasonably certain 
that attacks on European territory will be met. Um, partly because of the capacity, of course, as I mentioned before, but partly also because of the fact that uh, if you are in southern Europe, you do not look at the Baltic countries as an immediate core security interest, I believe. That's my own experience. Perhaps I would be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, others would say something different. But uh, then, of course, uh, as I also said, Article 5 has all sorts of uh, um, fairly vague uh, parts. Uh, you do not need to get out of NATO to take a position that in the case of an attack against, say, a Baltic country, you will not meet that with a full-scale military response. You could very well say, well, Article 5 defines only that you should regard this as an attack upon the whole alliance, and then the response depends on how you sort of want to measure the response. Now, if there is, as we presumably always think about, an escalation uh, of tension uh, where uh, it's not very clear exactly what has happened, for example, some kind of green man somewhere, or if something has happened on the basis of uh, something that has been done by, let's say, Lithuania or Latvia or Estonia, uh, now the response can be measured uh, according to the interests of particular the United States. Uh, and I believe that, uh, as I said, the, the major interest for Sweden is to keep the United States involved in European security. That's the overriding interest. Thank you. Yes, well, I don't, for a while, I don't think that the uh, United States will leave NATO, period. Uh, but I think I, I thought your question also touched on the Middle East. Uh, I think we've seen during the autumn, we've seen efforts to some cooperation, some understanding, particularly between Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Lavrov, some good efforts. Uh, so far, they haven't succeeded, but there have been efforts from both sides. I think probably uh, Trump has hinted at that. Uh, he wants to see an end uh, uh, to the conflict in Syria. It's the worst ongoing conflict we have in the world. Most people have been killed and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, there have been this discrepancy. Uh, the West, the U.S. has concentrated on Mr. Assad, and the Russians are supporting it. I think possibly, well, the, if, they, if they compromise the Americans and the Russians, they'll probably leave Assad in place for some time and concentrate their military and other efforts on the Daesh, on the IS. I think that would be good. We'll see. But there is the other, I mean, Middle East this is a difficult place. I served as ambassador to Israel some 30 years ago. You've got the Israeli-Palestinian situation, where Trump comes out as, you know, very pro-Israel, what will be the long-term effects on the Palestinians from that. And then you have Iran. Uh, I've seen some statements from Iranian hardliners that are welcoming uh, Trump's position. Uh, and there is a very strong anti-Iran feelings in, in the U.S. Congress and all this. And also Trump has said he's not in favor of that agreement. That's a very big question mark about what will happen uh, in, in, on, on the Iran nuclear deal and, and the agreement and lifting of sanctions and American policy. We don't know. And that can go terribly wrong. Well, well, also, but I have many question marks on that. Middle East is a difficult place, and again, talking about Syria, I can't just talk about the United <coughs> States and Russia, you have, you have Saudi Arabia, you have Turkey, you have Iran, you have Iraq, and so on and so forth, and Israel also. So it's a difficult place. And Trump will learn this, as Amer other American presidents have learned to, you know, that Middle East is difficult. Thank you. Yeah, I I don't think his son in law will play a very important role in the long run, unfortunately, mm -hmm. even if we wish he could. But no, I just wanted to add on to what, what Sven was saying, and because I was thinking about that. I mean, um, for your own country, Mr. Ambassador, Iraq, uh, of course, has not favored very highly on the, on the Trump list so far, but uh, hopefully it will change that. But, uh, but uh, he has also said that he is fa in favor of moving. Um, the American embassy to, to, to Jerusalem to make it the capital of Israel. And he has nothing against the continued settlements on occupied West Bank. Uh, and of course, uh, if anything could uh, 
create problems in an already volatile part of the world, this would be it. So I'm, I'm really, really worried. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, <coughs> my name is uh, my name is Richard C. I'm the former UN official. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is the uh, we are talking about after the election, uh, when the election is has been made. So whether we like it or not, that's the reason. But uh, the fact is that within Europe uh, there is uh, also a before the elections. We have the French election coming, uh, the Netherlands, uh, the Germany, uh, and Sweden also, not, not so far. Uh, what about if um, everybody is looking or voting in the same line as, as uh, with for Trump? Uh, then I have, my question is, uh, can you very shortly say, yes, I maintain my comments of today, no, I don't. So that, that's very, very simple, when you have made the many comments on that. Uh, I have a second question, which is more specific. It's the, uh, the defense matter in Sweden is very much based on the, the uh, uh, solidarity declaration. So uh, currently, after the election, how is that being influenced? You mean solidarity declaration yeah. within the EU? Or? No, the solidarity in Sweden. Yeah. So, so that yeah, uh, I understand that on the one hand, uh, uh, Sweden expects the neighboring countries to come and support, uh -huh. but also underlined uh, uh, America is coming. But now we have new conditions. Well, uh, are you, will you begin as politicians to uh, tweet more? <laughs> Yes, Carmen. Yes. Um, well, thank you. Um, well, regarding the solidarity clause, if if you read it, it's it's quite clear that it states that we foresee that we are ready to support uh, our neighbors, all the EU uh, countries, and Norway and Iceland, if they should be affected by a, a, a crisis, uh, a catastrophe, or an uh, or an attack. Um, and we are, we will then uh, be ready to support both with civilian means and military <coughs> means. And we also then uh, hope that we will have the same kind of support if we should be affected. Uh, there is nothing said about the U.S. Uh, at all. So that's that's maybe some kind of uh, other hope that we work and build security together with others. But in our own solidarity uh, declaration, uh, there is. U.S. is not not inside that, and that hasn't changed after the election. And I think that Mr. Forsman will agree with me. Um, well, the scenario that uh, every election from now on will be Trump-like, well, then I think we have a lot of lot of problems. And uh, um, to put in this kind of scenario and then see what do we think the same? I think the. For me, at least, the basis would be the same, that it's, um, it's the, the government of Sweden, uh, its first priority must be to, well, to, to take care of the interests of Sweden and the Swedish people and try to keep us and our neighbours safe and independent. Thank you. So, well, to your first question, I think it's very valid, because there will be new elections. I think the best answer I've heard was many years ago after a referendum in, in France on the Maastricht and then a French journalist said, when I asked about this out, well, la réponse est non, quelle est la question? <laughs> and that's the reaction of many people now. That was the reaction in Britain, Brexit, you know, you vote against uh, the establishment or the capitalists or the bosses, what have you, again in the United States. Uh, and I think we see that in other places too. You're against. Whatever it is, you're against. You shouldn't tell me what I should do. I'm against. Uh, and we see how it will go in France, uh, where we probably will have a contest between Fillon and Marine Le Pen. She's very skillful, very skillful. We see. Uh, we have uh, more urgently uh, the the Italian referendum uh, on on the what is it, the fifth of December, with Renzi and May lows. Well, they may call another uh, election then, but again, there are many populist parties now. Germany are more confident about, confident about I think, uh, for America will sit it out. I don't expect them I mean, a large surprise at that. But I mean, this is 
What has happened in, in Britain, in America, may happen in France, may happen in Italy, may happen in, you mentioned, the, the Netherlands too. This is, of course, a sign, evidence of some very strong movements among people, population in, in our societies, uh, of a distance between the elite, the rich and the poor, or what have you, the urban and, and, and the countryside, and, and very strong uh, trends. And how do we deal with this? If we think that the outcome of it will be bad, someone will say, well, it's democratic, that's what they want. Uh, but I'm not sure it will, it's all for the good. So it's a very pertinent question, and it's a difficult question. Thank you. More questions? Or did you, Kenneth, did you uh, want to? No, okay. More questions. Yes, please, up in the back. Thank you. Ambassador of Georgia. So thank you, first of all, for such a seminar, such a gathering. I see that uh, relations with the United States after elections is very important for Sweden and probably understand that it's more important for Georgia, for a small country. And in this regard, I would uh, like to ask maybe Mr. Hickman, who mentioned that, as I understood, that the doors of NATO for Georgia and Ukraine would be closed in the nearest future. That's first. Secondly, Another question is that, uh, of course, continuing that idea that will international community, and in particular the United States, agree that, I repeat quite often, but I have to say it, that 20% of our territory is occupied by Russian military troops. And thirdly, we speak about Trump Putin relations. And is anybody able to tell me what happens after 2018? these relations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, on, on uh, Georgia and NATO, I have no uh, view of my own. I only quoted what Mr. Gideon Rachman wrote in his piece on the 15th of November uh, in the Financial Times, when he tried to sort of outline what a sort of uh, overreaching US-Russian understanding would look like, uh, that America would stop talking about uh, Georgian and Ukrainian membership of NATO, knowing that for, for Putin's Russia, these are sort of red lines. Um, I have no, uh, I didn't put forward any, any view of my own on that. Uh, what will happen uh, in 2018? It's a good question. Uh, my, my guess is that Putin will probably remain in power beyond 2018, maybe not until 2024, but a few more years. I'm not so sure about the Trump, as I said before, maybe it's a one, one, uh, one mandate period uh, president. Uh, and again, we talked about these two men, but I mean, uh, others have said here, uh, Orion said that uh, countries have, in a sense, eternal interests. I mean, there are eternal American interests, there are eternal U.S. interests, and so I mean, internal Swedish interests, which will not change, uh, irrespective of you, whoever happens to be president or prime minister at a given time. These are the long-term interests, uh, and that they will remain. Thank you. Could you no, just add, add on to what you said before. I think, I think, uh, what uh, after this this election campaign and 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 things that really worry us, and and the one thing, of course, as as, as you, you mentioned, and this is his post to truth. I mean, what will happen now to truth? What will happen to, to, to democracy? I mean, there are already voices saying that, that maybe we shouldn't, I mean, democracy and voting is too important for, uh, for people in general. So we really should, should go back to old times when only the, the nobility were able, and the priests, I guess, were, were, uh, were able to vote. Uh, but, I mean, what, what, what Trump has, has put a face to, and as we see now also emerging more and more in, in our own countries, is, is this, this, I'm not looking for facts, I'm looking for the facts that make me feel good. And, and whether they're true or not, that is beside the point. And I mean, he's also put a face on, 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 on racism and on xenophobia and on inequality. I mean, that women are less, less worth. I mean, there are, there are so many things now that are up in the air that, that would scare all of us, uh, except for all the different <coughs> policy implications. And this is where, where politicians, where you're going to play a very, very important role. Thank you. 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 Thank you
as will all of us do. And so we all have to go home and say, what, what, how can we fight this? How can we come back to the democratic liberal society that we thought that we had created? But this is now really going in another direction. Well, I, <coughs> the question by the Georgian ambassador provokes me a little bit in the sense that um, uh, it, it raises the issue which is always there in all discussions about uh, foreign policy and international politics, and that is the tension between real politik and moral principle positions. Now, moral principle positions, of course, would be in this case that Georgia obviously has the right to decide itself on what it wants to do in terms of security policy, i.e., to ask for membership of the uh, Atlantic Alliance. Now, of course, the Atlantic Alliance can then decide whether it wants to accept Georgia or Ukraine or whatever. But, but the tension there is, of course, that if uh, that is being done, then that necessarily provokes conflict, because as you are much more well aware of than, than others here, uh, the reason why Russia made the aggression in 2008 was to a very large extent <coughs> due to the fact that uh, Georgian uh, sort of NATO membership was an issue. Uh, it was promoted by the Americans, it was opposed by the Germans and, and by the French, but it was an issue and that was the reason to a very large extent uh, that Russia went uh, to, um, to war. So, should you take then a position that, well, we have to follow the moral principled positions in all respects, or should we take a realpolitik attitude? Now, this is something which constantly comes back in all discussions, and it's very hard to, to decide which, which stand to take. Of course, the politicians are there to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. More questions and comments? Yes, please, sir. Thank you. Andreas Kukuris, the Cyprus Ambassador. Uh, it is early to know how US foreign policy is going to mold itself. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Firstly, how engaged will a President Trump himself be in foreign policy or not? Secondly, we haven't had the foreign policy uh, mosaic apparatus really shaped yet. We've had a couple of appointments, but uh, not everybody has been appointed yet. So that in itself leads to the question of where will the US foreign policy head once we know who the Secretary of State will be and the Secretary of Defense. And in that case, who will be Primus into Paris? Who will be the one leading uh, if you have a disengaged President Trump in foreign policy? That's something I'd like the, the panel to, uh, to comment on as well. And secondly, if there is a disengagement by the United States uh, in various areas, if I think the Middle East is one area, uh, who, which country or countries will seek to fill that void? So very <laughs> difficult <laughs> questions, but please, yes, Oria. Well, I can, I can start, because it seems to me, I, I've been ambassador to Germany and France as well, I mean, in the European context, and for that matter, to Finland. Uh, but um, it seems to me that it is a repartition of roles. Uh, uh, Germany, for obvious reasons, has a problem in dealing with the Middle Eastern issues because of uh, historical background to Israel, etc., so there, uh, you can always see that Germany takes a sort of somewhat more cautious attitude. Uh, in respect to Eastern Europe, of course, uh, the contrary is true. I mean, Germany has a very active policy uh, trying to, uh, well, find solutions to these various problems and having very close relations with all the actors. France, uh, well, as shown today, I think, uh, uh, suddenly takes a very active attitude in regard to Syria or to the Middle East. That seems to be obvious, uh, necessarily, uh, a position which France should take or should have taken, I should say. Uh, um, 
perhaps with uh, more power, more sort of uh, strong leadership than it has had for the last years, uh, French foreign policy will be more substantively uh, oriented and, and more active. Uh, otherwise, uh, well, those, those are the two countries that really can do something. Uh, uh, you must know much better uh, which countries are involved in trying to do something about relations or your problems in, the, in your own region. But uh, my general uh, feeling is that you normally have these two countries. We, of course, are playing a role in all of these conflicts. To some extent. Thank you. Yeah. First, Kenneth, and then Sam. Well, I would say, Mr. Ambassador, that you really named it. I mean, there are a lot of things that we don't know at the moment. And as Mr. Hedman pointed out, perhaps in a way we are having this seminar a little bit too early. But on the other hand, I think it's good that we have it already uh, in this situation because we really have to watch carefully and, and think about. And, and, and analyze what is really happening and what could possibly happen. But there are a lot of question marks, and that is my biggest worry. Uh, at the same time, although it doesn't really fully adapt to, to foreign policy and security policy, um, there are big expectations, of course, among the voters who voted for Donald Trump about his presidency creating a big change. Uh, this is quite similar to the situation eight years ago when uh, Barack Obama was uh, elected president. And the hopes of what he should be possible to achieve was so big that he even himself started to, to take those hopes and, and, and uh, prospects down by saying, remember, I wasn't born in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was eight years ago. I think that in a way, Donald Trump is at the same position. There are a lot of things that he won't be able to fulfill, whether he likes to fulfill it or not. Because the American presidency is a part of a big system where there are <coughs> things you have to do, there are things you need to do, and there are perhaps some things that you can do on your own choice, but a lot of things are actually uh, determined by the system or, or, or the work of the collective, and I think that that will be one of the big surprises to Mr. Donald Trump when he finds out how little he can do in some areas, actually. And, well, in a way, in this case, it might be harm reduction. So, yeah, I was a credit as ambassador to Cyprus for four years five years in the 80s, and I followed the negotiations over uh, uh, an agreement uh, closely for these 30 years. Always been an optimist, not yet uh, fulfilled my optimism, but again, I see, I've seen progress, including in, in, in the last, uh, 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 the latest negotiations. On your question, if there would be an American disengagement from the Middle East, and I think in, in a sense, uh, Trump would wish this, but other Obama also, also wished this, but I mean, we were drawn into it. Obama was drawn into it against his wish, I would say, in Syria and, and, and uh, Libya, uh, Egypt, and uh, Trump would probably also be drawn into it. But if there would be a real uh, um, American disengagement from the Middle East, I, I understood your question, who would then fill the void? And of course, there is one country and one leader who have he has ambitions. That's Turkey and President Erdogan. It seems that you know one driving force to, uh, in this president is to restore something of the old Ottoman Empire. I won't say he has been very successful, but it seems that that, that, that you know the amb ambition is there. And well, now he has mended relations with Russia. He has mended relations uh, with uh, Israel. Uh, Relations uh, with Iran, as I understand, are pretty good. Uh, well, there are problems of Kurds and uh, all this and that. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, given the possibility, <laughs> Turkey would uh, like to fill the void if there is such a void, and it would be a major play. 
Thank you so much. I think this would have to be the uh, final word, I'm afraid, uh, because our, our two uh, elected <laughs> parliamentarians have to go to Poland for a vote, uh, and they don't want to miss that. Uh, I would like to thank the panel very much for your participation. Perhaps we can arrange a sim uh, similar seminar in six months' time, and then we will have some more things to say. But most of all, I'd like to thank you for, for uh, your participation. And thank the audience also for, for attending. And uh, the ISTP is arranging now and then uh, seminars of this kind, so we're very happy to welcome you again to our next uh, seminar. So thank you all very much, and why don't we give uh, the panel uh, a warm applause.